Hello and welcome to Downstream, the show that takes Andrew Breitbart's old adage that politics is downstream from culture and goes, yeah, sounds good, why the hell not? And in that spirit, I am really excited to introduce this week's guest, comedian, host of The Mash Report and reluctant standard bearer in the culture wars, Mish Kumar. <laughs> oh yeah, how are you? I'm all right. Thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedule of being mistaken for Ramesh Ranganathan. Well, it's, you know, it's a heady week. Get mistaken for Ramesh. <laughs> Watch seven episodes of Frasier. It's, I've got a lot going on. So- I mean, listen, I think that, you know, obviously it's a racist microaggression when you get mistaken for another South Asian, but every time I get mixed up with Pfizer Shaheen, my credit rating improves. So I'm like... <laughs> That's how, that's how that I feel bad? about that's how I feel about Ramesh. It, it definitely, <laughs> like at last, a son my parents can be. Yeah, proud exactly. Of. It definitely used to uh, it used to upset me, but now Ramesh is very rich. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, maybe that's Fair maybe enough. it's I mean, not like, so bad. If you ever need to like, I don't know, do like a little bit of mortgage fraud or something, it's yeah. gonna come in very handy. <laughs> he only did a bit of mortgage fraud. Come on, only a come on, judge! Only it was just it. it was just a soup son of mortgage fraud. It's not a big <laughs> a molecule. It wasn't of a fraud. big. It wasn't a big amount of mortgage fraud. <laughs> and when you think about it, it was in the spirit of post-colonial reparations. Yeah. So I think I should. I'm just re- you know claiming back what's owed to my people. <laughs> Listen, they did not take that excuse when I robbed the National Trust gift shop. They did not. They did not. <laughs> They did not, the backdated reparations were not, uh, was not a valid excuse. I mean, I, I, I think it ought to be, I mean, it can't be, um, any more, any more cynical than the girl who I saw claiming individual reparations, but that is another, <laughs> a, another beef that happened. How's your pandemic going, by the way? My pandemic Are you, are you is... having a good pandemic? <laughs> I really... Have any of your enemies died? You know, I... <laughs> That's a good pandemic. I've lost zero enemies, um, as far as I know. <laughs> um, it's, um, yeah, it's fine. It's weird, isn't it? Like, I sort of miss, um, I miss small talk that didn't involve death rates. Like, it sucks that <laughs> our small talk is now like, boy, the air's poisonous. Like, I, I really miss, like, just the general chat about the weather. Um, my pandemic is absolutely fine in the, not even in particularly the grand scheme of things, just it, even in the most basic scheme of things. My pandemic is fine because I worked through a lot of it and it's, it really, it it hasn't been a, a, it's, I've escaped relatively unscathed. Everyone I know that's had it has recovered from it. So, you know, and I haven't had it as well. So, I mean, all in all, no complaints from me. I think if you're in a position such as mine, you have a sort of moral obligation to shut up as yeah. frequently as possible because you know, either you... shut up or lip sync to imagine yeah you know <laughs> that's sh- what we want from our celebrities either silence <laughs> or actually doing something so cringy and annoying that gives us something to talk about i was thinking about that the other day because it must be coming up to the anniversary of that imagine video and it sort of just shows <laughs> yeah. you just the way all of my friends and my comedic colleagues minds worked I would say within three hours of that video going up, I had four group messages saying, hey, we're organising a piss take of that imagine <laughs> video. <laughs> it was a bad combination of a sort of like very sort of funny, maybe somewhat lacking in self-awareness thing and a bunch of comedians with nothing to do. And it was a really d- a confluence of circumstances because people were literally like, we got to take the piss out of this. It's ridiculous. But it also, it maybe also says something about comedy is that like, no shade to you lot, but you're essentially parasites on other people's sincerity. So like when you see other people being like horrendously sincere, it's like, that's material. I don't think that that is shade at all, Ash. I think that's pretty much the job description. Like, I think the word parasite it's very apt for comedians. (laughs) I mean, I was, I I, I want to get into this because I'm a, I'm, would, I've never tried doing comedy because I think it'd be really bad at it, but I love it. And I love dissecting and cutting into it and thinking what makes comedy work and what doesn't. And I think it's that ability to sort of identify a lack of self-awareness in other people and go like, that's my window. It's certainly something that I think um, 
the great sitcoms. I think particularly the great British... Actually, no, that's not true. I think the great British and American sitcoms, definitely sitcom characters, it, it's all about identifying a person's inability to spot their own weaknesses. You know, like mm. like Alan Partridge, like, is just all vulnerability, ultimately. <laughs> you know, and, and a lot of the best sitcom characters particularly are a sort of hair's breadth away from being, like protagonists in a really upsetting drama about a really tragic person. Like the line between those two things is so slim. Um, and I think it's why it it's why really great, really gifted comedic actors aren't able to sort of switch between comedy and drama because in some cases like the line is so... I, I watched Bridesmaids for the first time in years the mm. other day. And if when you look at that movie and the sort of circumstances of, you know, it's like... There's a lot of like real shit in that film. You know, she, her cupcake store went under the financial crisis. There's, and there's all this idea of like your sort of anxiety about your friends doing better than you. Everything Kristen Wiig does in that movie is a hair's breadth away from being like a really tragic drama about mm. somebody whose life is just spiraling out of control. But as it is, there's a whole scene where people take a dump in a sink. And so it's, <laughs> and that's, the, the fine line between comedy and but I drama. I thought that it was um, Uncut Gems, which like played yeah. with that line all the way yeah. through. And you don't know until the final millisecond, like what the film is, if it's a comedy or a tragedy, because it's that really unpleasant, because a lot of the time experiencing a comedy as a viewer is unpleasant. Yeah. Like you're invited to identify with this person who's making horrendous choices all the time. <laughs> like Uncut Gems just like ratchets that up to 11. Like I... For the entirety of that film, like my sphincters were clenched, like it was just so uncomfortable. The scene and when the they can't get in, like, when they can't get in through the door, is like <laughs> it's pure. Like I, I, that movie is basically what would happen if Martin Scorsese made Curb Your Enthusiasm. And also, yeah. I also think because it because of the age we are, you're a little younger than me, but you're younger than me, right? But in the sort of rough age I bracket so. that we're in, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I currently look like I've put my own ageing app on my own face. Like, I don't know how I've managed to do this in the pandemic. But um, we're programmed to find Adam Sandler funny. And I think mm. Uncut Gems, like Punch Drunk Love, they the people making those films know, like, under, like, it's a very deliberate thing. It wasn't like, oh, we auditioned a bunch of people. They are deliberately playing with your expectations of adam sandler and that movie it's is like, like you're waiting for 50 first dates adam sandler yeah. to come back <laughs> and to like sort of you know have this like happy end and to no longer be this like you know because comedy i guess in another way it's always dealing with like compulsive characters so yeah. they're slaves to their own misjudgment or anxiety or you know that's very very compulsive because if they had if the main character in a comedy had any self control. It wouldn't be a comedy. The yeah. thing, the thing wouldn't be happening. Yeah, yeah. And so you're waiting for for the sort of good compulsive behaviour to like uh, manifest a, a happy ending. And then it's like, oh shit! Like <laughs> he's just been like lenged in the face. Like, oh, <laughs> so yes. So I I have a I my take on that is that that film has a happy ending. Uncut mm -hmm. gems. Okay, right. Hot take me. Yeah, because I think that that is the only, that is the only way that that his his circumstance ends well for him because he's not going to stop. He won. Mm. He would and he would just be back in the same cycle. And in a way, the fact that he crests this wave of winning and everything going well for him, and then he just dies, is almost <laughs> like is almost the only way his life would end happily. Otherwise, it would just be a drawn out cycle of this sort of compulsive because he would just never be able to stop. And that mm. the look on his face at the end when he's just lying in that jewellery store, he's kind of smiling. And I really feel like that's a sort of deliberate thing that the Safdie brothers are trying to do is like trying to put this like doubt in the audience's mind because you've just seen the guy get shot in the face. <laughs> but it's I not... Mean, I kind of... I can buy that. And I suppose like from an internal perspective, I mean, this is where I'm going to be like, darling, I went to UCL and did it. Here we go. So, Let's get so into Freud it. So Freud is always appropriate. <laughs> but it is like this kind of like mimicking of like a buildup of like libidinal energy. And then once it's over, yeah, it's and like, then it's, you're dead. Yeah. <laughs> like gone. 
<laughs> it's like that, except you get shot in the face. Except you get shot in the face. Like lying in a wet patch. Like, God, it's a good movie. It's a great movie. Maybe I'll watch that again. I, I mean, so I, I didn't actually want to talk to you about Uncut Gems. I wanted to talk to you because... Full disclosure, I was like, rah, this is the only South Asian who's more hated by the Daily Express than I am. (laughs) (laughs) And so I was like, okay, I've really got to, I've really got to, you know, ask him like, how how did this happen? Like, here you are, you're a Desi boy, you land the BBC job, all you have to do is shut up and take your check. And here you are pissing everybody off and i i don't think that it's just to do do with you and your personal you know adam sandler compulsions to like this isn't just your death drive at the wheel although maybe it is your death drive at the wheel i think that what's happening at the moment is really interesting because comedy has become so fiercely politically contested and it's the thing which is held up as kind of prime battleground in the culture war. Yeah. And in some ways it's kind of funny because comedy was never really seen as like the A-list of the arts. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So it's yeah. not not the even by RSC people in it. And it's not not even by people in it. I mean uh, like yeah, comedy is what you do if you're not hot enough to make it as an actor. Like that's what that's. that's what I've been saying to everybody. Uh, in my case I was neither hot enough nor talented enough to make it as an actor. So it was a double but, whammy for me. But see that doesn't stop the hop untalented people and that's the thing that kills me is like if i was just 10 percent harder it wasn't mad that was mediocre i'd just be hot um but can you talk to me a bit about how you found yourself becoming this flashpoint for the culture i mean listen i i could very well ask you the same thing i did think as we were as as i was getting ready to talk to today i did think god this is like some sort of like weird like this is some like Daily Mail writer's worst nightmare. <laughs> it's you and me having a cop. This is like the Daily Mail's like worst nightmare version of that scene in Heat when De Niro and Pacino go for a coffee. Like it's a yeah. nightmare for them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess I could, I could sort of ask you the same thing. I mean, I don't. I I think there has to be. Listen, am I talking around the obvious? Brown. Let's yes. <laughs> Let's let's put a pin in that. Let's put a pin in the word brown just for a second because we can circle back to that. Um, I think it's very interesting because some of the um, some of the sort of culture war arguments were actually sort of playing out a little bit within comedy mm. before they. I, I, I guess like it's hard. It's very difficult to put order on the events that have happened in the last few years. And it's very difficult to have this sort of sequential chain of events where you say, OK, then that happened and then the Brexit vote happened and then this, that and then then Trump. And then it, it, it's very difficult to put an order on those events. But if you take 2016 as like a kind of breakthrough year for the culture war, mm. if that's a useful way of thinking of things, there had been arguments percolating in comedy the sort of year or so before that. And there was sort of this idea that, um, and the only reason I, I really think about that a lot is in 2015, I did a show in Edinburgh that I then toured that had a load of stuff about left wing, like a load of comedy material about mm. left wing and right wing ideas of comedy. And it, there was a sort of semi facetious routine about, how I think that it's easier to express left-wing beliefs through comedy, but that is fine because culture evens itself out because it's easy to express right-wing beliefs through action films. Elections. and ele- Yeah, elections, yeah. I mean, what my thing has always been, guys, you should get worse at winning elections because then <laughs> the, like, uh, the co- comedy about the news is always going to skew anti-government. And I mean... I I still remember the early 2000s. I don't remember there being a huge amount of comedy talking about how wonderful Tony Blair was. Like, I certainly don't Mm. remember, you know, if I think about the things that have really endured from that period in terms of the comedy, I I mean, if you watch In the Loop or The Thick of It, those are not exactly, you know, and Malcolm Tucker is the thinnest veiled cipher for (laughs) Alistair Campbell that I can possibly think of. So in my mind, it was always natural that 
the comedy that would be around would skew somewhat towards the left because we've had a t- Tory government since 2010. But um, there was this idea that comedy wasn't reflecting the broader streams of political thought and had actually, you know, there was this argument about in sort of late 2014, I think, when the BBC issued this somewhat clumsy, but I personally believe ultimately in the long term good thing. They sort of put out an edict that said every comedy panel show had to have one woman on it. Now, when you Mm. if you think about what a meagre demand that is. (laughs) We're fifty percent of the population, and we can't be fifty percent of the panel. And, and also, they were not asking for fifty; they were asking for one, <laughs> not fifty percent, one. And that kind of uncorked a real shitstorm of a dispute in in comedy. So some of those arguments had been brewing for a while. It's but but very much contained within comedy. There's no reason that anyone outside of the comedy industry would particularly have been aware that those things were happening. Um, So like, I guess in a sense, it was a kind of trial run for the sort of wider conversations about the culture war. So it started in comedy. So what I'm in a roundabout way, what I'm saying is I wasn't, I, I shouldn't be that surprised about the reaction that there has been to me doing what I consider to be, very innocuous comedy about the news. I mean, it just it just seems to me to be like a very British phenomenon because as far as I can tell, and obviously you do have, you know, cancel culture, more panics in the States as well, mm. but you don't necessarily have somebody like Trevor Noah or, you know, Jon Stewart when he was on the air being held up as an example of, look, here's a liberal establish- establishment and it's expressing itself through jokes through the medium of political joke yeah yeah. um like why has that become the symbol of you know a skewed media culture in this country in a way that it hasn't in the states well i i I mean i don't know is the answer the one theory that i have is that we have a lot of our comedy by nature of the broadcasting landscape of this country comes through the bbc and a lot of the arguments about comedy are proxy battles over the existence of the BBC and a lot of the people comedy becomes a very convenient um, way in for people to bash the license fee and the existence of the corporation. And that that's a huge factor. You know, ultimately Trevor Noah, John Stewart, John Oliver, they, you know, they all broadcast on private companies, you know, HBO Comedy mm. Central are, are not taking money from the American taxpayer. And so I think part of the reason that, you know, the the majority of the conversations about comedy do come down to BBC comedy. And, mm. you know, uh, to the extent that even people who don't broadcast on the BBC but get dragged into these articles have to be bracketed. I saw Adam Hills replying to an article where mm. he had been included saying, I, I haven't been on the BBC for about 10 years, <laughs> but he was included in this kind of list of BBC comedians. Um, and it's... I think it's a sort of useful, it's a sort of useful way in to attack the BBC in general, but then also to claim that there is some kind of nebulous cultural force that is biased Mm. against conservatism. And comedy is a sort of useful way in, I think, for people to make that argument. I mean, do you think that like the reason why comedy is identified in a way that like, you know, oil painting isn't Mm. is because comedy forces an audience into a position of being unguarded. Like when you laugh, you very rarely have control over the fact that you're laughing. So if there's something which is seen to be ideological within that, it's seen as so much more insidious because it is this quite physical involuntary response yeah and it's seen as a tacit endorsement of those ideas which as we all know from experiencing our own comedy is not necessarily true there there is a there is an extent to which you could be laughing at something and find some of the ideas behind it unpleasant that Mm. there, there are times in which you don't necessarily have control of the laughter but it's um i i i think that there is i think that there is this obsession with that somehow these people who keep winning elections 
and by and large see their views reflected in almost every single newspaper in the country mm. and uh, have really won the big political debates of the last decade is not enough for them. <laughs> it's just not enough. And they want, you know, I think they want a sort of total control over the cultural conversation. And the problem with that is that they're too shit at comedy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, th- I think like, I, I, you know, when I've seen the kind of, you know, comedy unleashed, like stand-ups and stuff, what's really struck me about that is how forced the laughter is. It's this kind of hectoring of, you know, they're going to say you can't laugh at this. Therefore, you yeah. will. And the laughter itself is like, yes, I'm laughing to stick one in the eye of Owen Jones. Like, it's this really strange, like, kind of forced and inauthentic. That's how it strikes me. It strikes me as, like, really, really inauthentic. The thing that I think is interesting about those things, sort of philosophically, is the idea of that comedy club is that it's a free speech comedy night where you can say anything, which is... Um, every comedy night Mm. which is like every single comedy club you know and there's comedy clubs all over the country you know in every single town or city there's a weekend comedy club that works on a friday and a thursday friday saturday night and i mean I, i listen i have a deep well of affection for those places because that's where i first experienced comedy it's where i first did comedy and there was something genuinely exciting about the atmosphere in one of those clubs. And some of it is because the audience might turn on you at any second. You know, it is, it, do, it does genuinely, you know, because people don't, people pay to see a comedy night. They don't, they're by and large not paying to see a specific comedian because those comedians mm. they will go and see in their touring shows. This is you paying to see a mixed bill. It's part of a night out. There's a lot of people who are very drunk. And I, those environments are incredibly exciting. What I will say about them is they are not bastions of leftist thought (laughs) but i mean i always thought that like if you've got a free speech comedy night you can say anything you can do anything and what you choose to do is the same joke about trans people yeah yeah that's i identify as a helicopter that's the that's the that's that's the joke that's the one you know that's which is not even funny and also and sometimes you see people extending the route to that same joke and yeah. you're like but i know what path we're on mate Come yeah exactly on. but also you can make those awful jokes at comedy clubs and what i think is really interesting is it's for people who decry the concept of a safe space they have made a safe space for themselves <laughs> they've made a safe space for themselves because they were ultimately oppressed by their own profound lack of talent. And, <laughs> it, you know, because it's, it's nothing to do with your political beliefs. It, it, things that work or don't work in those comedy clubs on Friday and Saturday nights. And, it, they, you know, it's not a hand-picked, you know, if I do a tour show, there's about 5% political variation in the entire audience. You know? <laughs> like, it's either, you, you know, it's basically people who subscribe to the Guardian or recently cancelled their Guardian subscription. Like, basically, <laughs> that's, like, roughly the political variation mm-hmm. in an audience. But in a comedy club, it's much more representative. And you do have, st- you know, st- but the reason that they've had to create this comedy club is because their jokes weren't good enough in- <laughs> to work. Because... They couldn't, they couldn't sustain contact with reality. Yeah, like, exactly. A real a- a- audience. Yeah, absolutely. So instead, they have to sort of... You know, because you can have whatever argument you want about broadcast network and stuff, but there are really very few gatekeepers in those comedy clubs. Like it, the mm. booking agents are only going to book people that they know will get laughs. And they, they've they had to kind of excuse that inability to make it work by saying, well, look, the audience is everything. There's such a like pervasive culture of censorship that the mm. audience is sent. And that's why they're not laughing. And yeah. I recognise that need uh, to explain why the audience is not laughing as part of some sort of grand political strategy that's against me from when I was shit. So I remember that. <laughs> so I don't, I'm not unsympathetic. I'm not unsympathetic towards it. But I mean, you you had that gig, which like, um, where you got a bread roll chucked at you because you made some Brexit jokes and yeah. Piers Morgan picked up on it. Yeah. And it was a real moment of crowing and perceived victory for the mm. right. And one of the things that I found interesting about your response, because you were like, well, I'm a comedian. I'm kind of, I'm kind of in this to like have bad nights. I'm kind of in it to like, 
you know, die on stage occasionally. And I sort of thought, well, in a way, it's really good that what happened was the most absurd version of what could have happened, mm. which is they provided you with a funny situation, which when it's exposed to a wider audience outside of that room of being booed and having a bread roll chucked at you, um, that that in itself becomes an extension of your comedy. Yeah, your it was, it, it, in a sense, it was, yeah, I mean, it was so weird. It was so strange <laughs> because, listen, I take it as a huge compliment that the one time I have a bad gig in that calendar year, it makes the news. I take that as a huge <laughs> affirmation of my skill as a comedian. But um, it was, I, it sounds mad. I, I sort of don't mind. I didn't mind, mm. I don't. I, I don't agree with throwing things. Obviously, it's very funny the thing that they threw was a bread roll. And also, I would say, if you're an audience that may have aligned yourselves, may have aligned yourselves politically with a party that's resulted in massive increases in food bank usage, the optics of throwing food around are not great, right? But also, I would say, don't, you know, don't throw things at people. That's not great. But booing, it's kind of fine. Like... I had a right to say what I said. They had a right to do what they did. And that's the end of it. The the thing the thing that became a problem was when somebody passed a video of it to the Telegraph. And mm. then it becomes, listen, there is, I've got to think of a better metaphor for this, but it's a kind of human centipede effect whereby <laughs> the thing that happens in the room gets eaten and then shat into mm. the mouth of the Telegraph which then eats it and shits it into the mouth of loads of Twitter accounts. And by the end, by the time it's actually shat onto the faces of the British public, the story is that I put on a beret and brought out an AK-47 and <laughs> demanded that Conservatives be lined up against the wall of the Park Lane Hotel that they were all in. And so that's that's when it becomes a problem. When it gets taken out of the room... And when it gets taken away from what actually happened, it becomes much more of an issue. And that, and over the course of that twenty-four hours, that's when you know the death threats start. Mm. And that, and you know, you, you know, unfortunately, you know all too well about this kind of thing, where the kind of mach the outrage machine takes it and starts passing it around. And then by the time you start reading somebody telling you why they want to kill you the reason is so far away from I made some Brexit jokes and someone threw a bread roll at me and has become twisted and warped into something else. And, um, you know, I, it was, it was, it was really funny having to explain to a policeman why, <laughs> why the, somebody had threatened to kill me. It was, I mean, what, how do, how do you deal with it? I mean, like emotionally, how do you deal with it? Like for me, clap backs it's it that's how I feel I recover some agency from it because I yeah, go sure. oh like you know you are never gonna be able to throw something at me that I can't throw back yeah but that's the public facing bit of it and the private bit of it is like yeah how do you how do you handle that sleeping yeah um so a, a few ways one is um the really big lesson I had from this was like the first time the far right really, really wanted to kill me was like back in 2016. And it was like, I woke up and it was just like insane. It was death threats. It was people trying to find the address of where it worked. Mm. It was, you know, all of that. And I had like a few days of not really being able to sleep. And then I, I was with, I was with my best mate and another one of our friends came around and they just sort of quite gently took away my laptop and my phone and put on the Anthony Joshua fight and made boozy milkshakes. Yeah. And then a couple of days later, me and my best friend got matching tattoos, which said PG, which stood for the neighborhood and also pretty gang. And after that, I was like, okay, well, the counterweight to all of this violence is a real life social, yeah. you know, kind of big cushiony pile of blankets and it's a set of people who you vibe with so well and so closely that there's no room for the other stuff yeah and then also these kind of like real life demonstrations of care and solidarity like my best mate doing something as dumb as getting a tattoo on him forever <laughs> forever <laughs> um, that's right you know, to, to kind of make me feel better and that's that's there's various versions of that is how i deal with it is clapbacks and then real life but occasionally i mean you must get this occasionally i'm like 
I am dealing with this not very well. I am becoming snappy. I'm becoming tense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, my partner is very good at going, just take a breath. Okay. Mm. Just let's just take a breath and think about this and think about this kind of practically. And um, I think, uh, you know, I like, I'm very lucky. I, my job means that I can, F- grab some it, like what well, I think what you said about having agency back is really important and mm. one of the things that I've tried to stop doing so much is spending uh, spending too much time trying to seriously engage with people on Twitter who are not arguing from a point of they're arguing in bad faith and mm. it's just a waste of time to kind of go I at no point have said we should kill all white people yeah so but you know, because when when that, when initially your impulse is to go, that's an awful thing to have said that I've said. So I have to mm. go and correct. But you just don't have. There's not enough hours in the day, and you expend a lot of emotional energy trying to argue with people who won't ever take it seriously. That's one thing when it's anonymous, but. What about when it's someone who works for the same institution as you? Yeah, so when sure. Andrew Neil was saying that something you've done is anti-British drivel and it's yeah, really yeah. gunning for you. Yeah. How do you then go, okay, this isn't a fight that I've chosen to have and yeah. perhaps not in this way with someone who works and is so senior within the institution that I also work for, but what do you do? Well, what do luckily you do with that? when that happened, um, we were broadcasting at the time. So we then... Mm. We'd had this idea about talking about impartiality on the BBC for a while. And the week that that Andrew Neil thing happened, uh, it was like one of those things where, you you know, I couldn't believe what was going on. You know, I look at my phone Mm. and Andrew Neil is, I I think he was like, (laughs) it was very late at night. I don't know what was going on in his life, (laughs) but he had gone on this sort of tirade about how the show was anti-British drivel is what he said. And it was all packaged in this kind of, tirade about Carol Cadwallader and the journalism that she was doing about, you know, potential Russian interference in the Brexit vote and the Trump vote. And which I think is a very interesting because you like, you realize you're sort of all part of some, you were all like different heads on an amorphous bogeyman that sort of exists for Mm. people. But also with her work, you're like, it's lawyers have looked at that work. You know, like it was, it, she wasn't just like randomly tweeting. These were articles that were published that had to go through like legal, fr- you know, it's it's weird. Um, and, but we were broadcasting that week. So immediately everyone at the show was like, we have to, we can do the BBC impartiality thing and talk about this. Um, and um, we gave Carol a right to reply because that felt like something that should be done on the BBC. Mm. And so as soon as you can kind of put things in motion, and again, you like it feels like you're taking agency in the situation. Um, and also, you know, when there isn't a global pandemic on, the thing that I'm doing four or five nights of the week, most of my life is doing stand up on stage. And mm. that, again, makes you feel like you have control of it. And it, being able to tell your own version of a story that's being put out about you on stage in front of people is really important because one of the things that gets taken away from you when, and you will well know this, when you get swallowed up into the mm. outrage human centipede, which I swear to God, I'm going to find a better metaphor for. <laughs> no, I think, it, I think you've got the right one. I once, think that's the right one. Once, you're, once something that's been said about you is being eaten and shat into people's mouths mm. and then eaten and shat into other people's mouths, the the most important or one of the most important things is to be able to feel like you can tell your side of the story. Um, and, um, and yeah, and that, it, it, that, de- that definitely really helps. I mean, do you think like from within the BBC now that there's perhaps a bit of capitulation to the culture war, na- culture war narrative that's happening around it? So you do get these sort of briefings saying that, you know, there's going to be an impartiality lecture for everyone who works there, that there's going to be a kind of war on woke and restrictions about, you know, where BBC staff can, well, can so go I, politically. The, the interesting thing is that I don't I don't see any of those things and I would never see it because, I mean, it's it, these, are, these are the slightly boring vagaries of being 
of the employment contracts and stuff, but I mm. don't work for the BBC. So I work for a show that the BBC has then bought off Sepatron, oh. who are the production company. So in theory, I am not, I wouldn't be subject to those things. I, I don't really understand how it works. What I will say is, I think the BBC is really trying to appease people who will never be appeased by it. Mm. I think the BBC is really trying to compromise with people who aren't trying to compromise with them. What do these? What do? What does an organisation like the Mail? or any of the Murdoch papers, what is their ultimate goal here? Their goal here is not to have a balanced representative BBC. Their goal is either for the BBC to effectively be a propaganda distribution network for the government, or really what their goal ultimately is, is for the BBC to not exist, because the BBC stands Mm. as a kind of buttress against a complete media whitewash by you know the Murdoch papers the Rothermere group like these aren't they're not they're the BBC is a direct competitor to them and Mm. so when the BBC tries to compromise with them there is an element of the antelope trying to meet the lion halfway (laughs) and you think guys you you can give them you can cut off your leg and feed it to them but they aren't going to go. Thank you very much. We're done. <laughs> They're going to if you if you give them an inch, they will take a mile. And that that mm. I think is the thing that I that I find most frustrating and worrying for the future of the BBC. Because I think that on an, any number of levels, a public, a healthy functioning public broadcaster is an essential component of a democracy. You know, I think we need. Uh, 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 we, you know, like the National Health Service, I think the BBC, a public owned entity mm. that provides news is essential. But also from, a, you know, and it's harder to make this as an essential case, but from a perspective of the arts, it's good to have a public broadcaster. It's good to have somebody putting money into things that don't necessarily have a guaranteed commercial payoff. You know, I, I'm just not sure that even if I take it into comedy, I'm just not sure that a commercial broadcaster is going to risk giving Ricky Gervais and Stephen Merchant, two guys with moderate, at best, track records, total control of a six-part sitcom. Mm. I, I, you know, I, they, they, would, they did it because the BBC commissioner thought this is good and worthwhile, so maybe it should, you know, maybe it should exist. That, the Adam Curtis documentary. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, no one else is going to be. It's hard to justify that. those things commercially, yeah. and so it is good that those things exist. But my concern at the moment is that the BBC is falling into the trap of trying to meet people halfway that are not trying to compromise with them. Like it's, it, 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 you know, it's it's idiotic to assume that they're going to that the mail is suddenly just going to go. Oh, they did this, this, and this. Fantastic! The BBC is great. Carry on. <laughs> you know, it's, it's... I mean, I I, th- I think you're completely right in identifying there are some very naked market interests here at play. Right? There's political interests about you know government propaganda. There's market interests in terms of you know wanting to disempower you know still the biggest beast in in the broadcast landscape. But I think there's also this third element, which is on television, you can see how much the country's changed. I mean, from what I see on telly now, from what I saw 15 years ago, 20 years ago when I was a kid, I mean, I remember when, you know, goodness gracious me was on telly. It was a massive family event because we were like, wow, we've never seen so many brown people on the telly and it's not crime watch. Like this is, (laughs) this is like such a huge moment. And, And now in terms of, you know, representation, you know, it is a real embodiment of where the country is in having accepting people that aren't white and also aren't straight and you yeah. know are from marginalized backgrounds as being part of the country itself and do you think that there's a part of that there's an attempt to roll back the clock on those small measures of representative progress which have been made yeah i think that that's that's definitely a part of it i think maybe i was sort of naive in terms of where the country was at 
five years ago, six years ago, maybe. Mm. But I just didn't realise that there were people that felt um, that felt that diversity, not if not diversity is the wrong word. Representation is the right word. It, representation was an attack on them, and mm. I think that I, I don't think I realised the extent to which that was something that people were that angry about. But yeah, I, th- I definitely think that there is a part of that that is, there is something that offends a certain demographic about, j- mm. even before I open my mouth, just me sat in that seat on BBC Two, there is some, there is a group of people that are very, very angry about that. And the solution for me under that circumstance would be to try and maybe appease them. And the fact that I then don't do that Mm. just compounds the thing. You know, it's like you can be brown in the public sphere as long as what you're saying in that sphere is Britain does not have a problem with racism. The country is fantastic. As long as you're saying all the right things that make people feel better, you know, what a fantastic job Britain did in ending slavery. Don't ask how it's died. But what a, what, <laughs> what, a, what a brilliant job Britain did. The statues are great. More statues. Do you remember when they just gave us India? Yeah. <laughs> they loaned us India for a bit. That was nice. They thought Queen Victoria was, was sad. They thought she looked grumpy in a portrait. <laughs> so they loaned us India for a bit. That was very nice. Um, as, if you're saying those things, then that's fine. But if you have the brazen audacity to be brown and then <laughs> and then not necessarily have those opinions then that definitely winds people up and then on top of that if you're a if you're a brown woman then is that's like even oh my god that's even oh, worse no, when you're a brown woman they don't know if they want to bang you or murder you <laughs> or both i mean it really is it's this like such like horny murderous energy yeah. that I find it kind of confusing sometimes like you know my role play with my partner is just pretend you voted Brexit like it's actually <laughs> really started to like you know mess with my, my sense of like how people how people are meant to treat me I see the things um, that people are tweeting to you when you quote tweet them and you th- is that like that weird like horny racialized hate dis- like it's a whole like Freud would have a field day with it's, some of these people. I mean, this was actually something I kind of wanted to to ask you about because it seems to me that like in a really weird way, what you're seeing in America in terms of South Asian representation where South Asian men aren't, you know, being so desexualized anymore. Like, you know, you've got a South Asian lead in, you know, a Marvel movie and I don't know what they're giving him and I'm not suggesting for one minute it's the old anabolics, but it's very <laughs> impressive. Um <laughs> You know, you've he's stuck, got the man. way in which I, I've seen. Oh, I, 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 let hell? me tell you, I've seen those in real life. He's not those are uh, those muscles are not messing around. Now, Johnny Jesus is not Christ, I mean, messing around. What I, I was just like, <laughs> what did you do? Did you like amalgamate the musculature of all the other South Asians in Hollywood? So you're just like slicing bits of like you know Hari Kondabula and going, yep, have a bit of that stick that onto my calf. For me, like, it's not really even the South Asianness of it because like I've. You know, I've grown up watching South Asian athletes in cricket and stuff, and you know they're all stacked. For me, it's more the comedian of it. <laughs> it's, I, I, I'm more confused by that transformation as I'm like, how does a comedian do that? That's what blows my mind about it. But yeah, it's, I mean, it's kind of the Chris Pratt trajectory. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, of like yeah, you yeah. start off as like a kind of like a comedian, and then it's like, oh, you're in a Marvel movie, and suddenly you've got definition it's and it's stuff. genuinely impressive it blows my mind i uh listen but like, i'd kind of feel like the sexiness of south asian men there's more of it being recognized in the states and you can kind of see it the way in which riz ahmed is received in the states compared to here yeah sure whereas i think still there are still very very narrow constraints on like how you can be perceived as a south asian man yeah i think so yeah i mean i think riz is probably a really good example of that as somebody who is british started working here and then, you know, is this kind of like, like t- 
tiny little sex symbol, like a, like a pocket rocket <laughs> of a sex symbol in America. I was, and when like, I met him and I realised he wasn't that much taller than me, I was like, rah, like, <laughs> I should have pursued a career in doing what you do and then people would have thought I was tall. <laughs> like, <laughs> but he's, you know, he's, you know, when I see something like him in the night of, which is a, gr- a great show and he's amazing in it, I'm like, where, why is... Why is he having to go to America to do that? Like that sucks, mm. you know. It it, 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 you know, it irritates me when I see. It doesn't irritate me. I'm delighted for her. But when I see Lolly in something like Shrill, which is a great show, and she's great in mm. it, I, I, because I know Lolly, I know for a fact that like that she is. Those roles are not. Those roles don't really exist for her in the same way in this country. And like it, she's been doing comedy stuff and acting and stuff like that for years and it 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 frustrates me when i see i feel like we might be seeing a lot of really interesting talent and like london hughes has talked about this a lot recently when you know about why she because i mean she moved to la like just before the pandemic started and the basic subtext of everything she's saying is imagine how bad it was in britain for me (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> if I had to come to what was then Trump's America in the middle of a pandemic. And, you know, she's totally right. And, you know, I worry sometimes that there are, um, you know, that there are um, narrower bands. And also in this country, I feel like every time you start to have a conversation about race, people go, what about class? And yeah. then you kind of go... 100% absolutely mm. that is a really important conversation and there's no doubt that the one of the things that is being let, let left behind by representation is class in some way now, now I would say because of my political bias that that is the result of you know 10 years of funding cuts I, I mm. you know I've seen in the real world what those funding cuts do increased cost of living means that it's harder to exist and subsist like as an artist it's you know i would say that there's economic factors for it but i'm definitely like up for a conversation about class but what you then discover is very quickly people when they say working class they only mean white working class and um, they don't what's want to interesting consider to me is that as much as they consider it a rebuke to identity politics it's pure identity yeah politics. yeah absolutely yeah like my partner is white and he's working class. He would never in a million years describe himself as white working class yeah. because that is a definition which has emerged as a kind of way to delegitimize the language of anti-racism. Yeah. I mean, which is sprung up in that context. Yeah, which is, you know, which is boringly is like, it's kind of necessary for a certain socioeconomic group to remain politically dominant, right? The one thing mm. that, the one thing that they have to continuously do is to smash any class race solidarity. It, it, they have to sort of make sure that the white working class believes its interests are in direct competition with all ethnic minorities. Mm. Because if those two groups, that you know, that's most people. <laughs> if, if working class people and everyone from ethnic minorities starts voting as a block, then that is a really that's a dangerous voting block potentially. But then the ruling class are fucked. Yeah. They're fucked. Yeah. That's because I mean, unfortunately I, I, I that is most talk people. About, I don't want to talk about the class thing. So I think me and you've got like very similar educational backgrounds. I went to a grammar school for my sixth form. Mm-hmm. Then I went to UCL, you went to a grammar and then Durham. Yeah. And it seems to me like there is this sort of like you strata of like university educated, you know, South Asians with cultural capital who are, occupying certain positions within the public eye. Mm -hmm. And then what's missing from that are people who didn't have that background with the emphasis on education. You know, it was a degree of of social mobility, which was allowed because of the class background that your parents and your grandparents had before they came here. Yeah, totally. That's like one of the most, I feel like that's one of the most interesting things that isn't really discussed. You know, it's like, what were the circumstances? Because we we've been very good and I say we I'm lumping all South Asians into one block here but one Mm. of the things we've been very good at is like very carefully inventing the Drake myth of started from the bottom now we're here like we very (laughs) we very quickly been like we came here with nothing don't ask any questions about what we were doing (laughs) 
before <laughs> nothing nothing so why 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 were you in kenya no yeah. reason no <laughs> why reason in kenya? oh no oh, oh uh, normal reasons normal reasons <laughs> world of music we were doing world music. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. no exploitation yeah, yeah. Yeah, we weren't a manufactured middle class that was inserted by the british into kenya no we no <laughs> it was <Whoa>. womad <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was warm. <laughs> but like I, I kind of feel like when we talk about because you're having to defend some degree of representation against like the forces of reaction and you're right about that I mean sometimes we do reaffirm this myth of like well hang on we're talking about people we were middle class there yeah and now we're becoming middle class here yeah again after like a kind of generation of of or two of, of interruption yeah yeah it's yeah it's definitely um yeah, I mean, listen, it's an interesting myth that we have told quite successfully. Um, you know, I, I saw the picture of uh, that Rishi Sunak posted uh, on oh my God, yeah. yesterday or the day before where he was like, you know, you know, how could I have imagined that I would... And I, he sort of was like, statistically, you could have imagined it quite easily, my friend. You went to Winchester. <laughs> you went to Winchester. You went to one of the most elite public schools in this country. And now you're telling me, oh, you know, there's no way I could have imagined myself being Chancellor of the Exchequer. Look at his primary school uniform. You don't have a primary school <laughs> uniform like that unless you expect to be in the cabinet one day. <laughs> and like, uh, you know, in theory, in theory, stand-up comedy is a meritocracy. But in reality, the fact that I went to Durham University meant that there was already like a comedy organisation that went to mm. the Edinburgh Fringe every year and the university would part subsidise our trips to Edinburgh. And it was really like, particularly in Edinburgh, that I first had an idea that like this was something that I potentially could do for a career. But also it laid out in front of me what the vague shape of that career might take. And I was only really able to go there because of what university I went to. And I was only able mm. to go to what university I went to because of what school I went to. And you, you have to be careful. You have to really guard against telling the myth of yourself too potently, you know, or at least you need to have in the back of your mind a bit of self-awareness when you say things like, I made it on my own. You know, like, I, like, yeah, okay, 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 Mr. Grammar School, Durham University, you've made it on your own, <laughs> did you? You know, and, you know, that you definitely have to, like, guard against that sort of thing. And then, you know, it's like, wh one of the things that I've, I'm have i so grateful for is that I got, you know, like, I, I'm, I'm really grateful for the fact that I started comedy at the time that I did and lots of the people that I met, are my dearest friends and but also you know I started at the same time as someone like Ramesh and he and I have mm. been friends for that entire time and you know I really valued the fact that I you know you know when you can send each other text messages saying well someone thinks I'm you and I've just had a conversation <laughs> with them and not told them that that's not the case you know you can go back and, and I have forth not on that corrected question. them yeah. because I also stole their wallet <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's like that, that thing I really valued. And then one of the things that I really valued was Nick S. Schuckler, who's a novelist and also a sort of like, I don't even know what the other title you would give him. is like cultural well, godfather. You would, he is an enabler. He yeah. is a shadowy background figure who is just very quietly supporting loads of artists and writers of colour yeah. to... He he, yeah, he is. And the thing is, he sort of pulled me because he knows people in comedy as well. We kind of met through that. And he sort of through this The Good Immigrant, which is a sort of book of essays that this thing is the Japanese edition of it, which is insane. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's the Japanese edition. But he through that book pulled me into this like other world of uh, people from uh, people of color from across a bunch of disciplines. And it's through Nikesh that I, you know, met people like Rennie Edo Lodge and mm. Musa Wonga and Vinay Patel and Inu Elams. Like I got brought into this like whole other world and it's it really shifted my perspective and watching the amount that Nikesh has done in terms of shifting the conversation about representation and has made me kind of go it's not enough if we are if our sort of group of people the kind of 
uh, children of the upwardly mobile, people who are middle class anyway, and then mm. r- work to regain that status in a maximum two generations, but in some cases even one generation. Mm. What is our responsibility then to the next gr- group of people? You know, if we if we kicked out, if we had doors kicked open for us, my first job in television was writing for the relaunched Kumars at number 42. Oh, so wow. my first job in TV was writing for Sanjeev and Mira, who I, you know, grown up idolizing. So I feel like for me, the next conversations that I've got, I've got a responsibility to have are how, how do I make it so that somebody who is talented but doesn't have my educational background or privilege how did how did they get the opportunities that I've got this was one of the reasons why for me the art stuff about Corbynism you know for all of the flaws and you know missteps in the strategy and whatever and you can identify them all in hindsight but the thing that really spoke to me was the support for working class arts and saying that every single child has got an artist in them or a poet or a musician or something like that and it was something which, you know, collided with me when my mom was telling me the story. She's a social worker. And she was doing this, um, you know, thing where the kids in care sort of tell you how their experience has been. And there was this one kid who was just not interested in having that conversation at all and was really, really bored of the whole thing. And he was like, I want to, I want to be a comedian. Can I tell you, can I tell you a joke instead? And because he he also had learning difficulties, the way in which he told the joke was just so unexpected. It was not a typical pacing and structuring of this joke. And it was telling the story and it became funnier because of this kid's completely sideways entry yeah. into the humor. And so then my mom and the other person who's doing the assessment are like crying with laughter. <laughs> then she just felt this tremendous guilt of like, there's no obvious way for her to like guide this kid with this incredible talent into comedy. And it was this feeling of like, almost like a gate coming down of just because this kid has this incredible talent and it's not in spite of their circumstances. It's a talent that's from their circumstances. Yeah. And you know, he's sort of always telling his own story, even when he's not. Um, Yeah. But there's just no route into saying, this is well, where you the, go. This is the who great thing about to. someone like Josie Long is she sort of is just like she was just like she just gets on with stuff and does stuff. So she co-founded this charity called Arts Emergency, which is trying to work to redress some of that balance to sort of manufacture opportunities for people from low income backgrounds. Um, and this is my frustration with it is like when people say, "What about working class representation?" You're like, "Yes." Let's have <laughs> let's have that conversation. And then you realise they didn't want to have that conversation at all. They just didn't want to see a brown person on TV. Like, but they've somehow had to like drag this because you know, definitely I'm up for having I think that it's an essential conversation. And I think that social mobility has got worse in the last mm. 10, 15 years. Um, but the problem is. And this is this is coming back to me trying to stop arguing with people who I know are not trying to have an argument with me. It's that problem where you get into that conversation and you kind of go, "Oh, you you don't care about working class representation." Mm. And instead of that, instead of having that pointless conversation, I'm now like talking to Neil and Josie at Arts Emergency, and going, "Hey, how can can I help you? What can I what can I do to help?" Because that feels more proactive than getting wound up trying to convince somebody who isn't actually trying to have an argument with me and is just trying to call me anything other than the P word, which is what yeah. they really have wanted to do. The whole and time. you can see them looking, they are hitting up the thesaurus, looking for the synonyms. I remember somebody called me a Mohammedan once and I was like, wow, that is like oh Lawrence God. of Arabia era racism. God, like, that is unbelievable. Like a Mohammedan. You actually have to like, you, you, this part of you that's like, where have you even reached for that word? I, I'm. You're kind of impressed. You're like, well, yeah. you put so much effort into your racism. You didn't go for the obvious ones. And for <laughs> that, I applaud you. Yeah. Um, you're surprised at what words people reach for. For example, watermelon smiles and pickaninnies. It's always a surprise when people reach for those arcane <laughs> terms of racism. I mean, so I, th- I think this kind of like, in, in, in kind of natural way brings me around to 
the last thing which I wanted to talk to you about, which is I feel that for as much as the Spectator or the Telegraph or the Daily Mail try and mark you out as part of a noisy minority that's fundamentally unrepresentative, in terms of values, in terms of style of communication, pop culture references, you are just completely representative of of your generation. And that's mapped out by voting behavior and every study ever, ever done. And so thinking yeah, about that, apart conflict, from my fondness for Bob Dylan, which I think may be the only thing that marks me. You, off no, but generation. you know what? You're like every millennial who isn't like the other millennials. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly what I'm like. You know, yeah. I'm not. Do you a who? <laughs> like, you're not. You're not special, hun. Like, <laughs> oh, you think you just discovered blood on the tracks? Okay. <laughs> She's not like the other girls. Um, <laughs> You're not special, hun. Is very may very well be my epitaph. I mean, that's... I think that's the next comedy show of like. You're not... <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Um, it's not even like you're talking about like, you know, Woody Guthrie. Like you are yeah, like, yeah. talking about one of the biggest recording artists of all time. He's very famous. Yeah, and I think maybe that's why that's why a lot of these people are so angry. Is it, it, they're sort of angry. It, it, I'm it there maybe we're just in the way and actually it's very useful for them to have us because what they're angry really with is like this like a uh, you know like every every year somebody says oh my god why is the percentage of people that vote for left wing or center left parties why is the average age getting higher every year and you kind of go i mean it feels like a response to circumstances Mm. It does sort of feel like a response to circumstances. And it's that frustration that, you know, that I think is like, is at the heart of a lot of the, you know, the culture war stuff. You know, I think that there's like, in the same way as in the States, there's, there's definitely a generation of people that were shaken violently by the election of Obama and the slightly weird nebulous statistic that started going around that in 2042 the US would be a majority mm. non-white country which uh, Harry Harry Condobolo has a brilliant has an has an album called Waiting for 2042 and he has a joke <laughs> about how that only works if you think all other races are one race <laughs> it doesn't like white people are still the majority but i think that that like that the kernel of that sort of fear of what the internet conspiracy version of which is the sort of great replacement theory, all mm. that stuff, that kernel is is that fear. Do you feel that what you're doing is sort of talking for, you know, Keir Milburn calls it generation left. So it's all those people who just like can't, aren't going to get on the property ladder, can't vote conservative because you've got nothing to conserve. Values have changed, disposition has changed, but you're locked out of political powers like do you see that being the place where your comedy is aligned or do you visualize it as something different yeah I mean to be honest that is definitely that's the audience that comes out and sees me on tour and that's the most you know when you do something on television you don't really have you have no idea where where it's going you know we get told a million people watch this week and you're like I have no idea what those but when you go on tour and you see the audiences mm. you you have a rough sense of who you're you know, and and broadly, it is that. But I, I should say there are often exceptions of people who are much older than that. But broadly, it is that group of people, or it's at least the group of people whose like political philosophy aligns behind generation left, whether they're of that generation or not. Um, and you know, those people need a laugh. <laughs> <laughs> they keep losing elections. He's like, keep losing, they, like they keep losing elections. They're having a tough time, and those people, you know, those people need, those people need entertainment, and that is that's you know, if, if we can't have stuff. home ownership, then at least we've got <laughs> the comedy industrial complex, you know. <laughs> oh, Dan. Absolute fuck all about climate change, but that's fine. Nish Kumar's on telly. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, I'll yeah. Take it. Well, uh, in many ways, I am the ultimate disaster capitalist. <laughs> like I, Jacob Rees Mogg and I, in many ways, are very similar economic models. If but, things um, get any better, you're out of a job. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> Thank God. Thank God there's no sign of immediate improvement, Ash. Thank God. Well, Otherwise, I'm going to I'm gonna have to retrain in cyber. This is a oh, disaster. <laughs> or maybe you could at last finally become a lawyer. At last. At last. I mean, my mom, it doesn't matter, you know, what I'm on. She'll be like, well, you could have done law, couldn't you? Yeah, I know. See, this is what I think is impressive about your continual refusal to do, to, to do law, because at least for my parents, they had to give up that dream at some point when I was like trying to kick a basketball through a hoop in Taskmaster. I think there was a part <laughs> of them that was like, OK, the legal dream may be dead. Um, but with you, you're still on these shows. And you're still saying very serious things and arguing in a very coherent way. And so it must be difficult to keep <laughs> the wolf like, from the door. It's not even that far out. You argue with people for a living just exactly. for less money. <laughs> <laughs> it's she's it's not, hard, though. Listen, she's not wrong. Yeah, and you know, all that childhood of her telling me your grandmother came here with just the sari on her back and a penny in her pocket for nothing. Yeah, 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 yeah. So telling that story of my 17 year old grandma, I may as well spat in her face on the boat over, you know? <laughs> my grandmother says, because she has um, six grandchildren and two of them are under 18, so the jury's still out on those two. But the other four, she's like, we didn't get a single doctor or a oh single lawyer. Now, just to be clear, I did make friends with a kid at school who's now our family's doctor. So I've done, but the consistent obsession with having a lawyer in the family makes me wonder what these people are planning on doing. I, I you know, do think like, that South Asians, we're a very litigious people. I don't, you know? I have no idea. My mum's like, we don't have a lawyer in the family. I'm like, what, what kind of legal trouble are you planning on getting into? A, a hostile corporate takeover? What are you, yeah, like, <laughs> like, what's like, your what, plan? Is there some sort of criminal ring that I don't know about? <laughs> That you're no. all concerned about. Like, look, it, look, it, you're, it never hurts to have a defence lawyer on call, is what I'm saying. You know, <laughs> while stacking bricks of coke into like the family people carrier, just never that's hurts. What I'm that's what I'm concerned about. My dad is very mild-mannered, and that is the sort of thing that people subsequently say about someone who's been secretly bringing cocaine into this country. I watched Breaking Bad. I watched Breaking <laughs> Bad. Your dad is textbook meth cook. <laughs> is my dad cooking meth? I that mean, that is, would explain why I didn't see mine for 28 years, but, you know. <laughs> I don't, but you know what? I don't even think, in some ways, I'd really like it if he was, like, you know, a hardcore drug dealer. If he was, like, you know, the El Chapo of, of Greater <laughs> Manchester, but he's not. I think he's just a bum. <laughs> I think he just didn't really Sorry, I've been away for 28 years, but I've cooked a lot of meth. <laughs> Like, th this is my gift to you. Your inheritance, Yeah, this is your inheritance, darling. yeah. <laughs> I'd love it. I'd be like, okay, at last a reason, not just um, you had it two kids who would be a very funny, it would be a fantastically funny left turn for your career to go into a sort of suddenly, have you heard about Ash? Yeah, she's, she's running a meth empire now. Like, it turns out her dad was like a serious, and now she's just, oh, well. I guess, I guess that is the trajectory of all public leftists. Yeah, I guess um, you know, once Corbynism failed, we all had to find, we all had to find another way to live our dreams. You know, some people got behind Keir Starmer. I got, I got really into crack dealing. So. <laughs> oh my god. But Nish, thank you so much for joining us and giving up your time to come and chat with us on Downstream this week. It has been My pleasure, Ash. Let's you. all labour under the misapprehension that I had something better to do. <laughs> well, look, I'm just trying to hype you up, bro. In case your parents are watching this, I'm like, he was he was doing something socially productive and useful before he came on to talk to communists about dealing meth. <laughs> before he came to have the uh, to contribute his half of a Daily Mail reader's worst nightmare conversation. <laughs> Let's see if we can conference Owen in here. If oh we can get Owen God. Jones in as well. <laughs> my, my, I mean, I, I really love, like, uh, people say that, like, you can't give up your white privilege, but I've never seen someone so committed to giving that up any, any sort of oh my well gosh. wishes that might come his way because of being white. He was like, right, I'm just going to. That guy is really trying to burn his bridges. He... That guy is burning his white bridges left, right and centre. <laughs> I mean, it's an allyship or is it death drive? I don't know. I don't know. But sometimes I worry about him. 
I respect it. I, re- I, mean, I absolutely respect it. I, I do kind of think that it's appropriate that like we end this show, as with all good Navarro content, with an intervention for Owen Jones. Just like, <laughs> look, politically, I think you're doing great work, but sweetie, we're worried about you. We're so worried about you. We're genuinely so worried. We didn't have a choice. You yeah. could have opted out. You, you got a nice white face. You were born white and male. You won the jackpot of life. <laughs> And you spent it all on fireworks to let off in your own bathroom. You're like the Mario Balotelli of white men. Like, why is it always you? Owen Jones is UK politics's uncut gems. That's who he is. <laughs> Owen Jones has uncut gems his life. <laughs> It's oh god! I mean, I really hope that it, en- it ends a, it ends a different way um, for him. <laughs> like, that's that's all I can say. Like, I'm worried about him, but uh, he's doing great work. He's on that like list of. It's just when I see him or you, I just I know that the merry-go-round is coming towards me. I mean, like, it's just, just like what, see... one of us three is going to be the main character of right-wing Twitter for the day, and. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, keeps, just keeps going around it's like around. oh it's my turn it's okay Nish has had a rough time of it so you know when, uh, when that stuff happened the awful stuff happened with Sophie Duker when mm. when Sophie Duker responded to a conversation that the white host of a show instigated under a topic <laughs> that he and his writers had prepared and somehow Sophie Duker got the blame for it I, I sent her an email being like welcome <laughs> Welcome, Please collect your gift bag from the front desk. We shall see you at the secret meetings. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. My pleasure. Gary, kill the recording. Cut it, Gary. <laughs> <laughs>